What is up, family? I'm Dr. Dale, the author of How to Raise a Doctor of Wisdom from Parents Who Did It, the author of the Doctor Dot Children series, the author of Black Men and White Coast, the author of Pre Man Mondays, and the author of a new book called Author and Expert. That's coming out soon. That one's not out yet, but that one is coming out soon. You listen to the Black Men and White Coast podcast. Um, it's going to be a little bit different today. It's going to be really cool. You're going to love this. You're going to really enjoy it, especially those of you watching on YouTube. So if you're listening to this, definitely keep on listening to the podcast. So that's how you rock with us. But you want to take a moment, get on YouTube for this episode so you can actually watch what's happening, watch the presentation, things of that sort. You're really going to enjoy this one. Before I tell you who the guest speaker is today, um, I'm going to introduce our MCAT scholarship winner. And remember, hey, telling you all to apply. Apply. We haven't had, we haven't had MCAT scholarship applications come in and probably over a week now so we i think we have like just there's two more people i want to give give it to that i know so i have this week and i've got next week planned out already but other than that i don't there's nobody in the pool that's done everything the way we want it that we want to give that application to so we'll tell you guys this every week all you need to do is apply complete application and make sure it's a good application you know this application will take you 15 20 minutes and we're gonna pay for your MCAT for those of you who, who those of you who are taking the MCAT now we're gonna reimburse 320 dollars for your MCAT and all you gotta do is apply for the application it blows my mind that you guys aren't just flooding in this taking money um and like I said, we've been cutting checks. We've been sending these people your money, and they're, they're loving it. They're happy. So I really encourage those of you who are taking the MCAT, be smart. If you need the reimbursement, go ahead and apply for it. We're giving out money. And we want you all to take it, but you're not taking it. So I don't know what to tell you. Man. I don't know what to tell you. But this week's MCAT winner is Tyler Alexander. Tyler Alexander from the, as she says it, the Xavier University of Louisiana. Check out what Tyler has to say. Hi, my name is Tyler Alexander, and I'm a senior at the Xavier University of Louisiana, majoring in chemistry and minoring in biology on the pre med track. Early in my college career, I found a passion for public health research, specifically focused on women's health. At that point, I decided to combine my interest in medicine and research and work towards becoming a physician scientist. Currently, I'm conducting research related to Black women and fibroids, and have been able to see the need for more open lines of communication between doctors and their patients and how this can affect health outcomes positively. For this reason, as a researcher, I hope to bring awareness to disparities related to women's health. And as a physician, I hope to have an impact by taking time to listen to my patients, hear their concerns, and make them feel comfortable and heard. Personally, I feel this is how I can have an impact on women and my community. Congratulations, Tyler. We are paying for your MCAT. So all you need to do is email us info at blackmanandwhitecoats.org, info at blackmanandwhitecoats.org. Email us and we got you covered. We're going to cut you a check, send it to you, and you'll be good to go reimburse for your MCAT. So um, this week, <clears throat> do it a little bit different. So this, if you listen to Pre-Med Mondays on Monday when we released that episode, you know that my voice was completely gone. My voice still isn't all the way back. It's because... I coach my kids' basketball teams, and um, let's say when the gym is loud, I got to yell louder, right? So it's COVID safe, don't worry, because, you know, we do it in a very COVID safe manner, um, and we're vaccinated and such. But I do it in a, in a loud manner, so my voice goes away. So I don't have my voice, I'm struggling right now to talk, I don't have a voice to do an entire podcast, um, first podcast for this week's episode, so I actually have to reschedule the um, two recordings that I had scheduled for this week. So... What I'm going to do is something I've been meaning to do for a long time. I've had this on file for so long. I've got a few more of these on file that we need to get out here as episodes. I've been telling myself for years now to put these out as episodes. I was like, this is the perfect time to do it. So I'm actually going to let you guys hear from Dr. Bernard Harris. Dr. Bernard Harris, um, he was the keynote speaker at our first Black Men and White Coast Dallas Summit. The one we did in Dallas, our first one, um, a couple years ago. And just phenomenal. He is a Black male physician. He is an astronaut an astronaut and if i recall right the first black person to walk in space the first black person to walk in space we've had some great black folks in space you know, may jemison um um and, you know we've had some but I, I think if i recall the first one's actually spacewalk right that's pretty cool he's a black medical doctor another cool thing about him is actually i grew up outside of houston so I actually went to um high school and played ball with with his nephew so i grew you know i grew up with his nephew and um you know cool, cool guy cool guy so anyways i want you guys to hear from dr bernard harris hear his story hear his journey um and i think you're gonna love it man you are going to love it check it out all right 
right, so I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, um, who I can say I'm very excited to meet in person. Um, I heard Dr. Harris's name quite a bit when I was at Raytheon, where NASA was one of our biggest customers, so it was nice to finally meet him face to face. So a little bit about our keynote speaker, Dr. Harris. Dr. Bernard Harris currently serves as Chief Executive Officer of the National Institute of, my apologies, Chief Executive Officer of the National Math and Science Initiative, leading efforts to improve teacher effectiveness and student achievement in communities across the country. He has been involved in math and science for over 25 years through the Harris Institute Foundation. Dr. Harris was at NASA for 10 years where he constructed research in musculoskeletal physiology and clinical investigations of space adaptation. Dr. Harris developed in-flight medical devices to extend astronaut stays in space. A veteran astronaut for over 20 years, he has logged more than 438 hours and traveled more than 7 million miles in space. Dr. Harris earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Houston a Master of Medical Science from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, a Master of Business Administration from the University of Houston, and a Doctorate of Medicine from Texas Tech School of Medicine. He completed a residency in internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic, a National Research Fellowship at the NASA Ames Research Center, and trained as a flight surgeon at the Aerospace School of Medicine at Brooks Air Force Base. Dr. Harris is also the recipient of numerous awards, including honorary doctorates from Stony Brook University, SUNY, Morehouse School of Medicine, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Washington and Jefferson College, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, the University of Hartford and Indiana Institute of Technology, NASA Space Flight Medal, NASA Award of Merit, a fellow of the American College of Physicians, and was a recipient of the 2000 Horatio Auger Award. And we'll just stop there, because that's, that, that's enough. But if you would, please give a big round of applause and help me welcome to the stage, Dr. Bernard Harris. Thank you. Oh, I like that song. Good afternoon. How's everybody? You guys have been having fun today? Well, we're going to have some fun the next 30 minutes where I share with you a little bit of my background, a lot about uh, why I was asked to come here today as a physician who, um, as a kid, dreamed of becoming an astronaut. And so I'm going to share with you what that experience is like for, for a physician to actually travel in space. Because I, you know, when I speak to different audiences, I usually get uh, three common questions. You want to hear what those are? Is, Dr. Harris, you've been in space. What was it like to travel in space? And I hope to cover that uh, somewhat today. The other one is that you've been in space. Did you see any aliens? <laughs> and I have to say, I didn't see any real aliens, but some of the astronauts that I fly with are kind of strange. And I can tell you some stories about that. And probably the most common uh, question I get, whether it's a five-year-old or a 65-year-old, is how to go to the bathroom in space. <laughs> I don't know what it is about that question, just people want to know about those natural processes. Guess what? We're not going to talk about that today. So, but let me start by showing this slide. Um, this is a slide of a part of our universe. And uh, I actually got this slide from a friend of mine who's an astronomer. And basically, he showed this slide. And then he described what's in this slide. And as you look at this slide, there are millions of lights in this slide. And in this one slide, there are hundreds of thousands of galaxies in this slide, like the Milky Way. And then there are thousand, we think within those galaxies, other planets that may look like ours. This is, this is incredible when I, when I look at this slide to realize the vastness of the universe. Well, this friend of mine then took this slide and actually he had pulled it out of a larger slide. And in that larger slide, it was a slide of the moon. 
And just to, if, we, if you can imagine the moon taking up half the space of this slide, and this slide, this part of it that I'm showing you was one inch right next to the moon. So that was just a fraction of our galaxy, and we haven't even looked in all the different directions. So I, I first, first want you to, to understand the vastness of this universe and the complexity of this universe, and, and uh, to me, it kind of puts things in perspective. So it was 1969 that I saw Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon, and it was this black and white picture that really set it for me. I went running to my mom, I said, Mom, who was, who was an educator, by the way, would always ask me, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I said, uh, I don't know. And you know, through the years, I'd want to do things like be a, a fireman, like my cousin, or go into aerospace engineering, or do, you know, I had come up with all these different things. And finally, I had something that, that I could show her, or I could tell her, and that was to be an astronaut. So I went running to her, and I said, Mom, Mom, I know what I want to do when I grow up. And she said, what is it? I said, I want to be an astronaut. You know what she said to me? That's nice. <laughs> now, I know we have a lot of parents here today. And the biggest thing you can do, the most valuable thing you can do for young, young people is to do exactly what my mom did. And I, and I have to give you this picture. So she's in the kitchen. I come up, tell her what I want to do. And she goes, that's nice. And she's busy cooking and all that sort of thing. But then I think she realized that she probably ought to follow up with something that really changed my life. And that was you know what, that really is nice. And guess what, you can be and do anything that you want to be and do in life. And if my mother said that, you know what, from you know, God's uh, mouth to my ears, and I follow through with that. So it is important for you as parents to encourage your kids, no matter what they come to you with, to let them know that I don't, it doesn't matter what you want to do in life, what matters is that you have something you're thinking about doing and I'm going to help you support. I'm going to support you any way I can in that. And that was, that was powerful for me. Now, I have to tell you that uh, many, many years later, when she was standing five miles away from the, the vehicle as I was being launched, she regretted those words because she was really nervous. Anyway, so as, a, as an astronaut, the first thing you do is you come in and you spend about two years in basic training where you learn how to fly jets. In fact, the suit that I'm wearing today is the suit in which we use to fly jets when we're here on Earth, and we have other suits, which I'll show you in just a minute. And then you get selected, so you go through two years of basic training, learn all of these different things, and then you get selected for a crew. And then when you're selected for a crew, what we do is we come up first, before we even start training, the mission insignia. And the mission insignia is that thing that really denotes your mission. So you'll see here, this is a space shuttle discovery, Here's our mission insignia. If you look at my flight suit that I'm wearing right now, you'll see patches of the different missions that I've been on. This particular mission was a mission that went to the Mir space station, so you see the picture there. We were the first shuttle to go to the station. You see the picture uh, or uh, depiction of the American and Russian flag, and then the mission number was 63. So take a look at this slide and see if you can find the mission number assembled in this patch. And when you see it, yell it out, if you would. You see it? Anybody? Three stars. You guys got that? And three rays of the sun. Let me back up just for a second before we blast off. So you've got three stars and six rays of the sun. But you know the most important thing about this patch is? Is that it has my name on it right there. Can you see that, right? Oh, my later, ladies, there we go, right there. And that is so I can tell all my family and friends that I actually went into space. You know, you got to have evidence for that. So let's go to space, we would. So let's do the countdown. Eight, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now, I know you've seen that many times before, but you may not know that that vehicle weighs 5 million pounds. 
In order to get that five million pounds in the air, we have to light five engines that produce a thrust of seven and a half million pounds. And when those babies light, you are leaving this planet and nothing's gonna hold you to it. It's an incredible ride as you get catapulted into space. What you just saw just now is what we call first stage. And at first stage, we start from zero. As Soon as we get above the launch tower, we're going faster than the speed of sound, 750 miles an hour. And then another uh, two minutes, we reach an altitude of 100,000 feet, which is depicted here. And at that point, again, that's first stage, we drop off the solid rocket motors, they fall back in the ocean and, and recover, and we're going a mere 2,500 miles an hour now. And over the course of the next six and a half minutes, we'll go from being pushed back in our seat to three and a half times our weight under the acceleration of going into space to zero gravity, just like that. When we get up in orbit and we're safely in orbit, we then kick off the external tank, and that's that orange tank right there, and it was uh, falling away, you saw that little video. That falls back into the atmosphere and burns up on the way in. And then once that all happens, you go from being pushed back in your seat to three and a half times your weight. And by the way, the suit in which I'm going to show you in a minute weighs about 120 pounds. So imagine 120 pounds plus my 235 pounds. And you end up with that sensation of just under 1,000 pounds as you are being catapulted into space. And all of that stops in an instant as zero gravity takes effect. Now I want you to imagine what it would be like if we could turn off gravity in this room right now. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And the other question I have for you is what would you do if we could turn off gravity in this room? What would be the first thing you do? Think about that. I love, I love that because I want to get you stirred up to start thinking, now putting on your space hat, and imagine being in an environment where gravity is no longer in effect. And so the first thing I did is I got out of my seat and I floated up to the windowsill and I looked out and this is what I saw. So there is the planet Earth, there is the sun. We fly upside down to the vehicle. So you see the main engines of the vehicle. This is the robotic arm. And then I always like this slide because it shows you that the Earth is indeed round for all you Flat Earth Society members out there. <laughs> There is an organization called the Flat Earth Society. Look it up. So here's the crew. I was going to show you the two suits. So this is the suit that's 120 pounds. That's a launch and entry suit. And this is our EVA suit, extra vehicular activity suit. And it weighs 350 pounds. And of course, this picture was taken on Earth. And the only way I can take this picture is because there are suit, two suit technicians holding me up in the back and two holding the guy up here in the back. Now, why don't you take a look at our faces? Look at our faces. And now let's go over to the right, and this is a picture that we took on orbit. And notice how puffy our faces are. And notice one other thing. Look at Eileen Collins's hair. So this is our, our, the first commander and pilot of the space shuttle mission, female pilot shuttle mission. And she ends up, her hair is really nice and short, and she ends up with this instant afro, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so when gravity is no longer a fact, guess what? You ladies with long hair, you know, your hair will stand on end, and you'll look like a, like a sunflower or something with your face stuck, stuck in it. So I showed you the puffiness in the face, because we're, this is a medical conference. And this is the first sign of what we call space adaptation syndrome. As we go into a place that has microgravity, the fluid that's normally held down in our legs by gravity moves up toward our head and goes into the tissues of our face, and we're just talking about ENT, and what happens to astronauts for the first few days is that we feel like we have a head cold. Our sinuses are engorged from the extra fluid. And uh, we also, you might, you probably heard that doctors, uh, not doctors, but astronauts will, will um, actually grow in height one to two inches. And part of that, again, is from that fluid shift. As that fluid goes into the vertebral bodies and those that, that cushion, the discs in between the vertebral bodies, they swell up and they stretch our spine. And also the unloading of just not having the weight pressing down on the spine, we do indeed grow one to, one to two inches. Our heart gets smaller when we're in orbit. 
And uh, that is because we have the body senses that as too much fluid, and we get rid of that fluid. So over the next uh, two to three days, we will get rid of that fluid. And now that we're at a medical conference, and I know we're streaming this too, but I'm going to say this anyway. How do we get rid of fluid in the body? I heard it. Go to the restroom. So we fight over the toilet for the first couple of days as we downregulate our blood flow. So we have about five liters or five pints of, of blood in our body. We will reduce that by one-fifth, so we'll lose about a pint or so, or a little bit more, as the body adapts to zero gravity. And so now there's not as much blood in the circulatory system, and so the heart does not need as hard, so it actually shrinks, it atrophies in orbit. And at the same time, as it atrophies, it actually causes uh, changes in the blood flow itself. So as you shrink down the water within the blood, the red blood cells come together, and they're too close, we have too many red blood cells, and over time, within about two to three weeks, we will get rid of those red blood cells and, um, for example, I'll tell you, that there is consequences to that. In the International Space Station, when astronauts spend six months or so, they will reduce their red blood cells. And I'll give you an idea, and uh, the doctors will know this, but uh, you guys won't know this yet until you go to medical school or nursing school. We have about somewhere between 14, well, there's a, uh, there is a measure of hemoglobin in the blood. It's around 14, 12 to 14. When astronauts spend time, long times in space, that will be cut by half, so down to seven, which is perfectly fine as long as you stay in space. But when you come back down to Earth, guess what happens? You get dizzy, you pass out, and so we have remedies for, for that. So all of that, since we're a medical conference, we call space medicine and space adaptation syndrome. I was lucky enough on this mission to also do a, do a spacewalk. I'll come back to that in a second. That was kind of fun. But I thought I would show you a, a few pictures from on orbit. So starting up the upper left, that's a dust storm in space. So that's a dust storm coming off the Sahara Desert. If you then go over, that is Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, in which we flew through on my second mission. If you come down to the right, you'll see daytime and nighttime at the same time, which is kind of cool. I like saying that. And so you'll see. Nighttime on the right, daytime, and you can see Africa, and that's uh, Spain and England. And then over here is a picture of the space station, the Mir space station that we went to, and we're about 50 miles away from that. Here's another beautiful picture of Northern Lights, and then a picture of what a city looks like. This happens to be Anchorage. I was there a few weeks ago, and I took this picture to show them what it looks like from space. And by the way, if you don't try to get my laser pointer to work, that little spot here is what an airport looks like from an orbit. Now, I told you we blast off into space. I told you how we got to space, but I didn't tell you how fast we're traveling, around 17,500 miles an hour. And at 17,500 miles an hour, we can go around the world every 90 minutes. At 17,500 miles an hour, we see a sunset or sunrise every 45 minutes. So imagine that day and night, every 90 minutes. And here's, I'd like to show you what a sunrise looks like from space. <laughs> I love those special sound effects. That's kind of cool. That's exactly what I said when, when I saw it the first time. I went, Holy, are you kidding me? But anyway, in the time that it took those slides to cycle through was the amount of time that it takes for the sun to rise. And in that same period of time, the temperature will go from at night, minus 165 degrees, to 200 degrees within 10 minutes of the sun shining on you. So our space suits and our spaceships all have to accommodate that, that change uh, in temperature. Not only that, and you know, if I was just a small audience, I would be giving you some questions and things like that, but what's the, let me, well, let me throw that out. You guys yell it out. What is the other thing that we have to deal with when we're in orbit? So talk about temperature, weightlessness. 
No, right? No air. I heard the breeze. But what would happen if I walked outside without my space suit on? <laughs> That's exactly right. I would die. All right, so this is guess what I'm thinking. Space has no molecules, so essentially it is a vacuum. So if I walked outside with this suit on, I would explode. As the molecules inside my body would want to go to where there are no molecules, and essentially I would explode. So spacesuits are good. So I want to share with you at the time that we have left a little bit about, you know, and, and this is uh, sort of goes in the category of what does the future hold for you? Right now, we no longer fly the shuttle, but we have other companies that are building the next generation vehicles. So no longer do we just have one way in which to get to orbit, but we have several ways now. So you heard of SpaceX, so that's SpaceX vehicle that's now taking cargo up to the International Space Station. This is uh, Blue Origin, and then we have another, Sierra Nevada, has a shuttle-type vehicle. And within this, this year, you will see U.S. astronauts going on these commercially manufactured vehicles. And that's going to change the face of what we do, not only on, uh, on orbit, but here on Earth. And so we have the International Space Station right now where we have seven or eight people that are there 24-7, 365 days a year, making all sorts of uh, um, uh, advancements in, in science, including medicine. Then we will go to the moon. And then after we figure out how to, to survive on the moon, we'll go to Mars. And why Mars? Because out of all of the orbiting bodies, all of the planets in our solar system, it is the one that's most compatible to life here on Earth. And we can do it with our technology. So I'm an astronaut. I'm always thinking about, you know, what's happening, you know, above us. But I think it's also important, since most of us live here on Earth, and by the way, you know there are only been less than 500 people in the entire world who've actually gone to the space. So very, very few of you in this room will get a chance to do that, although that's going to increase with some of the commercial vehicles. And so you should be concerned about what's happening here on Earth. So over the last few years, all of these logos people know about. You know, When I was going to college, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no Internet, there was none of this stuff that you guys are growing up with. And in the future, we're going to be dealing with a lot of new things like artificial intelligence and robotics and quantum computing, uh, disruptive technologies that have yet to be invented, and they're in your minds, and this is your opportunity to, to add to this list as you finish whatever level of school that you're in right now in college and, go, and then go on to either medical school, we hope, or nursing school, or any of the allied health professions. And so the big question I have for you as you leave here and I'm thinking that you're here either because your, your parents are concerned about this question, and that is, are we prepared, are you prepared for the future? And the answer to that, thank you, is should be yes. <laughs> and part of the reason why you're here today is to, to address that, that question. So it's based on that question that, that I'm part of my new mission. You heard in my introduction that I'm the new CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, which is based right here in Dallas. And so I spend a lot of time here in Dallas and, and uh, Houston and across, across the country making sure that young people like yourself are prepared for that future. And we believe that STEM education and STEAM education, when you add the arts to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, really make the difference. They are going to be where the jobs are. And that previous slide that I showed you, that showed all of those new technologies, they're going to come from what I call knowledgeable people like you with creative minds to take that, that knowledge and turn it into, into something. And then I'm going to end with this. You guys know who that is? That's me. I was a cute kid. Wasn't I a cute kid? I was a cute kid. And so the first slide on the left is to show you that I was cute at some point in time and that I was a kid. The slide on the right is to show you that I did have hair at one point in time. And I'm jealous of all the young people I see out here with the af afro. 
But it's also just to remind you that I'm here because of a dream that I had as a kid. I'm here because I was not afraid to go after that dream. I'm here because I took the time to figure out what my dream, what it required for me to, to obtain that dream and to work hard to accomplish that dream. And I'm here because I discovered, luckily from, from my, my mother especially, but from my family, who I really was. And I want to pass that on to you. If I can do all the things that I have done, there is no excuse for you. No excuse. And so my last message here I'm going to leave you with is this poster that I created, and it's along a slogan that I think is very important. And it says, I'm an infinite being with infinite possibilities. And usually if I'm in an audience with uh, especially young people, I ask them to repeat that. But you know what? I'm going to do that for you. I want you to repeat after me. You guys ready for this? Yeah. All right. So as loud as you can, repeat after me. I'm an infinite being, I'm an infinite being. with infinite possibilities. That was really poor. <laughs> so we're going to do that again. And this time, let's rock the auditorium. You ready? I am an infinite being, I'm an infinite being. With, infinite with infinite possibilities. Let me tell you what that means. That means that each and every one of you in this room was born multipotential with the ability to do anything that you want to do in life. Number two. It means that each and every one of you in this room is multi-talented. You came in this world with certain talents. You know, some of you might wonder why you love music, why you can sing, why you can dance, why you can play basketball or football, and it just comes natural to you. You were born with that. And there are other abilities and talents that you can acquire using something that we walk around with every day, and that is our brain. And that's what Courses like this are, summits like these are for, that's what the classes and what you're taking in your schools are for, is to add to that talent tool, to that ability. And then lastly, and this is the most important thing, I believe that each and every one of you in this room was born for a reason, that there is a reason. There may be reasons that you hear on this planet. And if you believe all three of those things and believe that last one, you're going to make a difference, not only for yourself as an individual, you're going to make a difference for your community and eventually the nation. And with that, I'll say thank you very much, and I'll show you my last few slides, which is me walking in space, which was the funnest thing to do as an astronaut. Isn't that cool? Thank you. You can stay up here. We're going to do a Q&A. OK, sounds good. Thank you. We're getting an ovation. Great. Thank you.